Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Father Ed Meeks, and I want to welcome you to episode 15 of our apologetics podcast entitled, You Can Go Home Again. Today, we are going to wrap up our teaching series on the Marian doctrines of the Church, which has spanned the last four episodes. <clears throat> Some may wonder why I have spent so much time on this topic. The answer is first that there are, as I've indicated, four major Marian doctrines of the Church, and it takes time to unpack and develop an authentic understanding of each of them. And second, because as I also stated in an earlier episode, what the Church believes, professes, and teaches about Mary is among the most difficult of the Church's doctrines for most Protestants to accept. Because what most Protestants understand about the Church's belief in Mary is generally skewed and inaccurate, frankly, as in the straw man argument that we hear all the time, Catholics worship Mary, an error which I addressed earlier. So as we begin, <clears throat> let's look at a quote from St. John Henry Newman, which he wrote in his landmark work entitled The Development of Doctrine, again, which I cited in an earlier episode. Newman wrote this specifically regarding the Marian doctrines. Quote, We don't believe them because they have been made doctrines. Rather, they have been made doctrines because the Church has always believed them. End quote. So today, we are looking at the fourth of those doctrines, name namely the Assumption of Mary. As we begin, let me remind you once again of what the Catechism of the Catholic Church states in paragraph 487 on this subject. Quote, What the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ, and what it teaches about Mary illumines in turn its faith in Christ. End quote. This principle serves as the foundation for all of the Church's four established doctrines regarding the Blessed Virgin Mary. Those four doctrines, again, are her title, Mother of God, her perpetual virginity, her immaculate conception, and her assumption. In 1950, Pope Pius XII, formalizing and codifying an ages-old and widely held belief of the Church, declared the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary with these words, quote, The Immaculate Virgin, preserved free from all stain of original sin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory, and exalted by the Lord as Queen over all things so that she might be the more fully conformed to her Son, the Lord of Lords, and conqueror of sin and death. End quote. The Assumption, as the Catechism states, quote, is a singular participation in Mary's Son's resurrection and an anticipation of the resurrection of other Christians, end quote. In the document Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council, we read this, quote, The mother of Jesus, in the glory which she possesses in body and soul in heaven, in heaven, is the image and beginning of the church as it is to be perfected in the world to come. Likewise, she shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come, a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God, end quote. Now, our understanding of the Assumption is connected to the image of the Ark of the Covenant as an Old Testament type or prefiguring of Mary. We see this connection in Revelation chapter 11 in St. John's Vision of Heaven, where he writes in verse 19 of chapter 11 the following, quote, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. End quote. And then the very next sentence says this quote, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, 
a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. End quote. Now, we know from our study of the Old Testament how intent God was in instructing Moses and the Israelites on the importance of keeping the Ark of the Covenant intact and undefiled. So intent, in fact, that we even have the somewhat alarming biblical record in 2 Samuel 6-7 of a man named Uzzah being instantly struck dead for touching the Ark without authorization. As the Ark of the New Covenant, Mary was kept intact and undefiled in her immaculate conception by being preserved from original sin, by her perpetual virginity, and by her assumption into heaven, which prevented her body from being subjected to the corruption that physical death initiates. That corruption is one of the consequences of original sin, a state that Mary was free of by reason of her immaculate conception. It's difficult to imagine otherwise. I mean, think about it. It's difficult to imagine that the woman who had carried for nine months in her womb and given birth to the all-holy Son of God would then subsequently experience corruption and decomposition. Now, I want to ask you to pay very, uh, very special attention to what I'm about to say. Getting back to the issue of the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant as a type of Mary. The Old Testament Ark of the Covenant contained symbolically God's presence in the form of three specific objects. Those three specific objects were the tablets of the law given to Moses, that is, the Word of God. Secondly, the priestly staff of the high priest Aaron. And thirdly, some of the manna which fed the Israelites in the wilderness. So then Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, carried within herself, within her womb, God's real presence, the real physical Jesus, not merely the inscribed Word of God, but the Word of God made flesh, and then not merely a symbol of the priesthood, but our high priest himself, and not merely the bread known as manna, but the very bread of life. And so it's no coincidence, then, that St. John, in the book of Revelation, connects his vision of the Ark of the Covenant with his vision of the one who is the woman of Revelation 12. Let's read it again. Quote, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. End quote. Now this is actually what biblical scholars call a multiple reference. <clears throat> the woman is a prophetic and metaphorical reference to Israel and to the church, the new Israel. But it is also, in a very literal sense, a reference to Mary, a vision of Mary, the woman whom God speaks of in Genesis 3 when he tells Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. St. John the Apostle, who had been entrusted with Mary's care by Jesus from the cross, when Jesus spoke the words to Mary, Woman, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother, that St. John was the one who wrote those words in Revelation 12.1. The church has concluded from earliest times that the Apostle John was thus, thus blessed with a vision of Mary, whom he no doubt loved in a very special way as his own mother, a vision of her bodily, physically in heaven. So how did she get there? The answer, of course, is the assumption. So then if, as St. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, I think we could validly say that Mary is then the second fruits right behind her son. In both cases, 
that of Our Lord's Ascension and that of Our Lady's Assumption, the stage was set for them both to take on the loving task of intercession for us in heaven. And so then, just as the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception indicates that Mary was preemptively saved and redeemed and kept free from sin by the grace of God, the doctrine of the Assumption indicates that she was preemptively assumed, raised body and soul into heaven, and preserved from the corruption of death by the same grace of God. St. John of Damascus, known as St. John Damascene, writing in 745, said this, quote, <clears throat> He who had been pleased to become incarnate from her in his own person, and to become man, and to be born in the flesh, God the Word, the Lord of glory, who preserved her virginity intact after her giving birth, he was pleased, even after her departure from life, to honor her immaculate and undefiled body with incorruption and with translation to heaven prior to the common and universal resurrection. End quote. So then, even as Jesus' death and resurrection brought about his victory over sin and death, he showed us what that victory looks like when imparted to redeemed humanity in the person of Mary, his mother. Sin shown to be conquered in her immaculate conception, and death shown to be conquered in her assumption. A wonderful glimpse, in other words, of all that awaits you and me in glory. And so, brothers and sisters, let's rejoice as we contemplate this wonderful gift in the life of Jesus' mother and ours. Mary's body, assumed into heaven, is no longer mortal. It is no longer subject to the limits of time and space. A fact, by the way, that has made possible the countless apparitions of Our Lady throughout history. She now resides bodily with Jesus in heaven, a sign and a promise of what awaits all who die in the grace of Christ. If you are enjoying these podcasts, I again encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to them. And now let's conclude with God's blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you next time.